Prep it. It's not just for your crazy uncle anymore. If the pandemic taught us one thing, it was that most of us were underprepared in terms of material we had on hand that we might need if we are cut off from the regular supplies for too long. Josh Burmeister is an expert who trained people in SEER programs in the military and now brings that information to civilians and to organizations. He was kind enough to spend over an hour sharing what he knew with us so that we can go out and protect our families by having the right gear for us on hand. Thanks for watching today. Hit like, hit subscribe, come to the Patreon channel and support us for just $3 a month. Thank you. Now let's get to work. Hello and welcome back everybody to Safest Family on the Block, where knowledge is power. I'm your host, Jason, and joining me today is Josh Burmeister. Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, no problem. I'm excited to be here. We are really excited to have you. Now, Josh spent nearly 10 years in the U.S. Navy, finishing his career as the Chief SEER instructor, that's survival, is evasion, resistance, and escape, responsible for leading multiple high-risk Department of Defense training courses. He was the CEO of a Fort Bragg-based company that facilitated the training of over 4,000 students in firearms, tactics, trauma medicine, and combatives. His security experience ranges from numerous deployments to hostile environments, to protecting ultra-high net worth individuals domestically and abroad. Most recently, he's consulted for government contracting, healthcare, and commercial operations, assisting in security, training, operations, and human performance. And today he's here to talk to us about emergency preparedness, things like bug out bags, shelter in place kits, and how to get ourselves squared away before the emergency happens. I think most of us, I don't know when you're watching this, but we're in the tail end of the COVID crisis in May of 2021. And I think a lot of us got caught with our pants down about a year ago. And we're here to talk about how to avoid that in the, for whatever the next crisis is. Sound, sound about right, Chris? Chris, Chris is the guy who introduced us. You're Josh. <laughs> Chris did introduce us. He's a very good friend. He'll probably not be after this product, but it's okay. We'll, we'll do what we can to keep that friendship intact. So one of the things I noticed is I started this conversation by asking you whether you'd prefer to talk about bug out bags or shelter in place kits. Sure. And you started educating me right there about how that's the wrong conversation to have because the differences between those things are very muddy and uh, the right equipment in, say, the Olympic Olympia Peninsula out of Seattle sure. is a very different kit from the one there where you are in Boise. And both of those are the wrong kit for if you're in West Texas. So could you start at the very beginning? What's the first thing that families should understand about this kind of preparedness? Yeah, it's funny. I, you know, several years ago, uh, my brother, um, I think I sent him a book like one second after mm -hmm. or some dystopian fiction of some sort. And he was like, wow, I, I really need to start getting prepared. And I, okay, cool. And he's like, well, what do I need to buy? Right. And so the, the question came across very similar to the way you said, like, hey, mm -hmm. what's this, what's a bug out bag contents or what do we need at home? What are the products? What are the things? And I, I believe that there are many people that have come around to understanding that being prepared is a good idea, but they also think that I can just go onto Amazon, order a bag, throw it in the trunk of my car, and I am good. Um, and I just really want people to get out of that mindset. And I'd like to peel the layers of that back a little bit, uh, both by the circumstances, the environment that you're speaking of, and um, fine tune that to what people already have. And, and I think I try to keep some common, consistent themes throughout the way that uh, I push information out. Because I think maintaining a sense of normalcy, especially if you have children, uh, is really, really important. And so I try to take things, you know, if I were talking to some retired special forces guy, you know, he's like, cool, I need 550 cord, a good knife and a fire starter, and he can survive forever in the woods. But that's not the majority of the population. So I always try to push training and experience first, and then dovetail the equipment into that. Mm. Um, so that's kind of the major tenant that I would start with. And then when we actually talk about gear and the needs that we have, I want to get things that are relevant to the circumstances that you're in, which you alluded to, right? Geographic locations and things like that, times of year, training and skills. Um, and then what your actual mission is. Um, 
So if you go deep down the rabbit hole into the preparedness world, you'll know there are such things as bug out bags, get home bags, inch bags, which is I'm never coming home. There's, a, there's all these different iterations. Um, so for the context of this particular conversation, we can at least talk about it in being mobile, meaning I'm at my home and I do believe the best uh, idea is to try and shelter in place, stay at home as much as you can, if, if at all possible. But there are circumstances where you just have to leave. Could be a wildfire, could be a tornado, some of the hurricanes that have come through on the East Coast, um, sometimes civil unrest, you know, sheltering in place is not the best choice. Uh, so I like to talk to people about knowing those um, instances where it might be best to leave and then what you would need. It, it could conversely be you're at work and you need to get home. So, so the mobility piece, I think in our conversation, we can stick to that as much as possible. Okay. And we'll talk about some of the basic needs and then some of the maybe gear that I would recommend inside of that. Does that, does that sound okay? That sounds perfect. Cool. I think that uh, especially for parents, that mobility that when the disaster happens, the first thing that goes to your mind is, okay, where's my kid? Where's my spouse? And how am I getting from where I am to where that is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and having the right equipment to survive anything immediate and to make that trek, however long it is, I think is on forefront of a lot of our minds. Yeah. And I'm really glad you brought that up. I, there are, it seems that there is this notion that somehow everything's going to be right. So you're going to be at home. Someone's going to come across your TV or send an alert on your mobile phone that says, you must go right now. And mm -hmm. that's not hardly ever the circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. as, as you said, I could have a child in school, the other spouse that's at work somewhere across town, maybe somebody that's even traveling. And somehow you have to coordinate all of those efforts to make sure everyone's on the same page and then actually begin some of your actions. Um, so I'm glad you kind of put it in that context. Um, one of our one of our earlier guests, Brandy Champeau, who's a communications expert, told this terrifying story of being in a tornado when she had two young children, one of whom was younger than school age, one of whom was in school, in the middle of the school day. And so she sheltered in her closet with the youngest one and then walked across a hurricane-torn city or tornado-torn city through the wreckage to the school wow. to find out if her daughter was okay. Wow. And so that's that's the kind of thing that we need to be ready for, especially yeah. if we live, if we're not here in the Pacific Northwest, which is basically the Shire mm. um, and live somewhere <laughs> where there are more, you know, where natural catastrophes are more common. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I look at the communications piece is mm -hmm. really the first part. I, I, I do want to take a, a step back. So I said, you know, I kind of mm -hmm. have common tenants. I try to put information out in the mm -hmm. same way. And you're pinging on one that's really important, the communication. But I want to I want to put in place an acronym if you have not heard before mm -hmm. um, that may help people at home. Um, so it's a PACE. PACE is the mm -hmm. acronym. If you haven't heard that before, your audience. So PACE is P is for primary, A alternate, C contingency, and E emergency. So what I tr strive to do for any kind of emergency preparedness and planning is I try to have a PACE plan for my communications, for my mobility, for my food, water, shelter, security, sanitation, all of those things. I try to have a plan so that I don't have that single point of failure. And then it also allows me to be on the same page with other people. So as it relates to this communication piece, I think in this day and age, it's pretty easy to say that mobile phones are our primary form of communication. Mm -hmm. But we can take that a little bit of a step further. We can talk about making sure that our kids have relevant numbers. We can make sure that we have the kids and then the school's relevant numbers. And then sometimes we might need those in a hard copy because if our phone doesn't work, our, again, Murphy's Law says, inevitably when you need your phone the most, it will be the time that you forgot to plug it in and there's yeah. no power and you don't have any way to get the phone numbers for your kid's school or it's just it's inevitable yeah. that things will trail and go like a series of unfortunate events um, i mean for crying out loud um, to this day my wife's phone number is siri call my wife um right <laughs> right right, and I, right i had the one time and i should fix this but the last time i was without my phone i had to call my dad because he's still got the number i had growing up mm -hmm. and ask him for my wife's phone number yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's exactly the situation you, that we don't want to be in. 
Right. That's exactly right. And so <laughs> when I so so a couple of things when we mm -hmm. start talking about um, a pace plan is that we need to make sure that we are focusing on not only the different forms of communication that we may have, but also the different media that we may have. So mm -hmm. if you have a phone and you're like, well, I'm going to call and then I'm going to text and then I'm going to use signal because it's secure. And if not, I'm going to use maybe some emergency, something else. Well, that means if your phone breaks three of your communications plans out the window. Uh, so we need to mix up both how we communicate and then what the media is that we're using. Um, so just as a, for instance, uh, for me in my vehicle, I have my, my primary phone and calling is the easiest or texting even these days seems mm -hmm. to be more, more prevalent than calling. Uh, Especially in there, an emergency because that test will kind of wait in queue until uh, communications are restored. So, yeah, and, and that's yeah. a big part, right, is that that phone system we've seen historically can be, um, like much of our critical infrastructure, can be a little iffy when things start mm -hmm. getting overloaded, right? Yeah. Um, so we look at our phones, and then I have another simple, cheap burner phone that I go to Walmart and buy. Uh, for me, I, I use them for work as well, so it's pretty easy for me to keep. A, and I always buy a phone that's on a different carrier, so if Verizon's up, Sprint, I've got a backup. If Sprint's down, I've got Verizon. So I have some redundancies there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my primary and my alternate. I have also my iPad that's Wi-Fi connected. And so I can text through there. Mm -hmm. And then my um, contingency plan is I have an in-reach satellite transponder, which is a fabulous mm -hmm. piece of gear. It's a little bit expensive to get into it. Right now, REI has them on sale, I think $50 off or something like that. Pretty good deal on them. But they're essentially a small satellite transponder that allows you to not only have maps that you can Bluetooth to your device, so I can have maps, good contour maps on a, uh, an iPad or an electronic device, but allows me to send text messages through satellite down to someone else. So if mm. the phones are bad in your area or you're somewhere where there is no reception, you can still ping out to a normal number. And then if you have people that have in reaches as well, you can communicate entirely on the satellite network and not, and it's still Bluetooth through your phone. It's like an, or your iPad and it's a normal uh, texting kind of app. Um, it works really well. It can drop a pin. And then it also has uh, a, an SOS button for mm. emergency services. And you can go and subscribe to different levels of care and uh, emergency response with that. So it's a little pricey to get into mm. about $300, but mm. a fantastic tool that really nothing else can really replicate aside from maybe a sat phone. And that's way more yeah. money. Um, yeah, it sounds like it can, it can turns any of your devices basically into a sat phone in a lot of the most important ways. Well, so you have no uh, voice, yeah. you can't speak, yeah. but text message, mm. it drops a pin with your lat long and that emergency you know, mm. the ability to like, I'm really in trouble and I have no mm. way. Out. And it, um, uh, there have been some very, very cool examples of where people have had to use those in the back country. Um, specifically, I know of one story where the guy that was a rescue pilot on the helicopters that went to go get people actually had to use an in-reach device himself because he was on a, a, a horseback uh, excursion out into the back country and a woman mm. fell off. And so he's talking to the pilots, talking them in, wow. that are his buddies, you know, coming to get him. So it's, it's, a, it's an unbelievably mm -hmm. great device. Again, I, I don't get anything mm -hmm. for it. I've just, I've used them for a long time. Any kind of PLB or personal mm -hmm. locator beacon or anything like that is, is tremendous. And then just to round out that last pace piece, yeah. my, mm -hmm. it would be a ham radio, right? A small handheld mm -hmm. ham radio. So I have different media, different devices. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the important piece of this is to know that everybody else understands the same pace plan with the communication. Yeah. And to kind of hit on one of my pet peeves as a safety and self-defense instructor, that $300 in-reach device, you're thinking, man, that is kind of steep. Mm. But the next time one of my viewers wants to go blow $700 on another gun, yeah. but don't have yeah. this really essential communications device. Yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 the, that priority, there's a lot of things we'll drop $300 on without thinking about. Right. But uh, this, that sounds like a, that's definitely going on my, my birthday list at the very least. <laughs> yeah. I would at least encourage you to take a mm -hmm. look at it. It might not be the right fit for you. Um, mm -hmm. I spend an inordinate amount of time um, outside alone, far mm -hmm. from anybody else. And so for me, I mean, I, I often think about, you know, what happens if I just trip and fall and I'm, I'm up on this, mm -hmm. you know, I'm at 6,000 foot on some rock 
and my <laughs> ankles broke. I, I can't hunk, I can't hike out. It would be very difficult for me to tell somebody exactly where I am. Um, all I have to do is hit a button. Now I have, again, I can send a text to my brother or mm. my dad or somebody that maybe can come get me, but sometimes I'm not in that position. And so I need the mm. professionals to come get me. So it's, mm. it's a unique device, but it does cost a little bit. And, and I agree with you. A lot of people will spend, you know, they've got their gun safes full of guns, tons of ammo. And one, they continue to think that that's the only solution. And number two, they have no training and they continue to buy more and more guns. So yes, mm. we're on the same page on the pet peeve <laughs> part there. So, so this PACE plan for your communications, I suspect we're going to hear this word PACE a lot in this conversation. Yeah, I, I try yeah. to. I like to get people mm -hmm. into that mentality. So uh, mm -hmm. just, just bouncing around a touch, we'll get back kind of in an order here. But yeah. let's say we're talking about routes to and from mm -hmm. work or school or things like that. I, I think it's important to look at where your natural choke points are, where traffic mm -hmm. might be um, really bad under uh, extremist circumstances, and have some alternate routes to get to and from certain places. Um, mm. I, I think it's just a good practice. Um, there is some security that's involved in that as well. But if you only know one way to get to your child's school, uh, as we talked about with the woman that had to go um, check on her child, I, I think that if there's only one way to do that, you might be in some trouble. It would probably be better off to have a primary route, an alternate route, mm. a contingency route, and an emergency route. One of them might be by your car. One might be by your bicycle. One might be by you know, public transportation, one might be breaking brush right through the tornado damage, I, you know, but uh, it's just, I think if people look at that and say, okay, what do I have for my water? What do I have for my food? What's the primary thing? I try to keep that as close to normal as possible, mm -hmm. meaning it's not, you're not asking your eight-year-old to jump on some GMRS frequency on your Baofeng radio and, you know, try to <laughs> dial in with your handheld kind of thing. It, it's not that it's like, Hey, just shoot me a text. And so mm -hmm. we keep it as much as normal as possible. And then we work our way back from there. Um, I try to approach things like that, that it just seems mm -hmm. to be, again, I have kids. Um, they're a little bit older now they're teenagers, but well, actually my daughter's 20 now. So she's not even a teenager, but the idea of taking them camping, looking at maps, showing them mile markers on roads, how highways are oriented North and South, all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I try to just bake into normal everyday things so that that is their sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the gear I try to keep so that they're happy as well. Because again, with children, we know if they're not happy, everything gets a little bit harder in life. This taxes mm -hmm. everything a little bit more. Yeah, and that mental health, health aspect during an emergency, especially, again, I think this year has taught a lot of us more than we ever hoped we would need to know. Sure. about how keeping as many things normal as possible, having skills trained in normal circumstances. I mean, that's the basis, that's the importance of training, right? Yeah. Uh, whatever it is, whether it's your firearms, your self-defense, your water purification, you don't want to be trying to figure it out under the added stressors of an emergency. Yes. And, th and that goes right into what I was talking about. Everybody mm -hmm. just wants to say, buy these items and you'll be safe. Mm -hmm. Even that inReach, if somebody invested in it, you have to kind of mm -hmm. get into it. It's, it's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. time when I'm like, oh, I really need to contact somebody to help me out should not be mm -hmm. the first time I've turned it on and used it, right? And that goes across the mm -hmm. board for all mm -hmm. of the equipment, right? Yeah, as an illustrative example, uh, several months ago, my, my, son, my youngest son and my first wife, he was with her for the weekend and their roommate died of natural causes, just in the tub, some kind of heart thing. And th his mom, couldn't make 911 work on her phone. And a little bit of bragging, my son figured it out, just picked up the phone. Hey, Siri, call 911. But yeah, that's awesome. With a device that she uses every day, mm -hmm. a phone. And in that moment, because stress hormones mm -hmm. remove our higher order thinking skills. You know, so and that that's the kind of touch point that I think about when I think about training and practice that if a grown, competent adult with two master's degrees and professional job, a good, competent human being, mm -hmm. can't figure out 911 in the clutch, yeah. I'm not going to be cocky about using a, a satellite radio for the very first time. Right, right. Yeah, it, you know, you, you pinged on mm -hmm. something that's very interesting, you know, is the, the piece of stress. A big part yeah. of the 
types of training that I've been involved in centers around stress inoculation. Mm -hmm. And again, if we can introduce stress, right? So if you uh, have ever taken a child camping for the first time, or maybe a wife, girlfriend for the first time, mm -hmm. it's usually memorable. They're trying to keep everything super, super clean. They're kind of freaked out about everything. And then after a couple of times, they kind of settle in. It's like, okay, cool. This is how we cook on the Dutch oven. Here's, I make sure my sleeping pads inflated this time. So I'm not sleeping on the cold ground. Like you start learning all of these little things mm -hmm. and all of a sudden that's kind of normal and it's not stressful anymore. And so I think that that's uh, something that's important to do along with the gear that you acquire is make sure that you're getting a little experience with it in some conditions that are not mm -hmm. ideal. And I'm not saying, you know, go drive out 50 miles into the desert and walk mm -hmm. back. I'm not suggesting anything like that. But as we do talk about some of the equipment and gear, mm -hmm. the more familiar we are with it, the more normalized it is, mm -hmm. the, the easier it will be to transition through a tough set of circumstances for a period of time. Oh, that makes sense. The idea that, you know, I reached out to you about kind of a list of gear, but really the, mm -hmm. the mindset and the practice that you have will make having less gear safer. And if you've never, if all you've done is bought one of those pre-packaged kits and shoved it in your car, it's going to do you some good, but not a lot of good if you've never thought about it, never practiced. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would rather choose a few items that I knew intimately, like the back of my hand mm -hmm. versus a bag full of stuff that is essentially like foreign to me. Right. I mean, I have no yeah. idea. Um, and, and then the other problem is, is oftentimes, Hey, money's tight. Everybody's on a budget. Mm -hmm. I understand it can get very expensive to start preparing. They see these go bags that are online and they're kind of like everything you need. Well, the problem is, is that I, I will say just arbitrarily half of it is going to be crap mm. and not not quality equipment so i would take things that i knew were very well received very well established as quality by people that actually use things as opposed to well this thing was pretty cheap and now my life depends on it and i really hope things turn out okay that's that's not an ideal like hope is not a strategy so <laughs> You know, I would just like to have a little yeah. bit more time and thought put into certain items uh, to make sure that people are comfortable with them. I'll tell yeah, you my although, number one item. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, ahead. yeah. Uh, a lot of our viewers, I think, might not have a lot of experience with those pre-made tactical mm -hmm. boogie bags, but all of them have dealt with like the $14.99 Walmart first aid yeah. kit. Yeah. That yeah. comes, that's all padded out and has it. If you ever tried to take a splinter out with the tweezers that come in that, yeah, I think you understand exactly what Josh is talking about. Yeah, it's like using the chopsticks from Seven Eleven or something. You know what I mean? There's yeah, this, yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's not right? good. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you're saying, what's your number one item? I mean, other than your brain. <laughs> so brain, yes. But I will tell you, yeah. like, if I have mm -hmm. to recommend one item for everybody to have with them, mm -hmm. good footwear. I mm -hmm. don't care if you're wearing a Hugo Boss suit in the middle of downtown Philadelphia or. Uh, you're wearing your sundress in, in, you know, in Colorado, wherever you are, the ability to put on quality footwear mm. and be mobile, and that's for you and everybody else, is tremendously important. Yeah. And, and just to give some context, you know, a lot of the circumstances that we talk about with a bag or items in your vehicle that may assist you, we like to think it's going to be the zombie apocalypse, or, or not like to think of, but that's where usually our brain goes, right? At EMP, mm. these huge natural disasters. But oftentimes when I do training, I do some things that are simple. Uh, you know, I'll give a scenario. You're driving down a country road between two towns. It's a little bit rural. There just happens to be an area that has a dead zone for your cell phone mm -hmm. and a truck in front of you dropped a two by four. You ran over it with both tires. And now you have, even though you have a can of fix a flat, you've got two flat tires. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're kind of stuck, right? You, you have mm -hmm. to move at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that in dress shoes that I wear with a suit. Most women probably don't want to do that in heels or pumps or, or anything like that. I don't like doing it in my heels. It's problematic. Yeah. <laughs> so I would rather just wear good, comfortable, broken shoes. Yeah. Um, good tennis shoes are good enough. Mm -hmm. But if you have some good hiking boots or mm -hmm. something that you've used for a while, and again, not the brand new ones. We want ones that you've worn a little bit, but that are not worn out. And so just yeah. that piece, 
um, ways to keep the kids a little bit mobile. So, yeah. you know, shorter legs don't move as fast as ours. So if you have to be able to put them in a stroller wagon, something like that. Now we, at least we have some mobility. We can move, yeah. we can take some things with us. We can get out of danger or get ourselves into a better place that we can help our own recovery or, um, you know, a positive outcome. That's absolutely essential. Uh, one of the best techniques I ever heard about this, it was uh, in Nick Hughes's book, How to Be Your Own Bodyguard, was when you buy your new pair of, ten, of running shoes or hiking boots, because the old ones are a little worn out, the new ones go on your feet, the old ones go in your car. Yes. And yep. just, just as, a, as a habit for life moving forward from today. Yeah. As it's just tell you always got a pair of nice broken in walking around footwear. Yeah. In the car at all, at all times. Yep. And, and I think there's a couple of things and that's sound mm -hmm. advice. Uh, and I think there's mm -hmm. a couple other things that kind of go with that. Yeah. Um, you know, weather can be problematic. Mm -hmm. So even if your circumstances aren't horrible, uh, I was explaining to you today, you know, we've had yeah. some pretty warm weather and then it just dropped. And now it's about maybe mm -hmm. 65 and a little breezy. Um, you add a little bit of water or rain into just that somewhat nice day mm -hmm. and your day can get really bad. I mean, you can start hyping out pretty quick, uh, hypothermia, sorry. Um, you know, you can, your, your circumstances can change very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I always like to have a couple other mm -hmm. things, just a, a, a beanie. I mean, as you can see, mm -hmm. I don't have much hair on the head, so a, my head gets cold quick, but a beanie is a good one, a nice raincoat. Um, and then, you know, just some, some comfortable clothes. If you know, you routinely wear a suit or business attire, just some good functional clothes and footwear and a couple layers, man, they just go such a long way to making your day better. And if you're usually going to work in either hose or those thin nylon dress socks, good mm -hmm. socks, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Almost as important. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that socks are really expensive. You know, when you were a kid, yeah. they were like, Oh, I can get my six pack for $4. <laughs> and you're like, wait, these like smart wool PhDs are like $24. Like what is that? <laughs> right. But, uh, and there are some cheaper good socks in between there, but, uh, yeah, socks mm -hmm. are really important as well. I agree. Yeah. Standard. So we kind of ran, we've, but we digress. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, I do that a yeah. bit. My bad. It's, it's, no, my, my bad too. I love nerding out about all this stuff. It's a it's an occupation hazard of the show. Though we were taught, we've been talking about communications and routes, and I think you had a progression. So we talked about routes to get home from work. You know, my my situation is very lucky. I work from home, and my uh, the elementary school is two blocks to the west, and the middle school is two blocks to the southeast. So it's pretty pretty centralized communications until the kid got to high school but uh, after routes what, what's our next consideration so let's touch mm -hmm. a little bit more on yeah. on the routes just for a moment so absolutely uh there's kind of an old joke in this community mm -hmm. what's the different like what do you call a um someone that's bugging out without a destination a uh, refugee <laughs> So my point here is, is that when we do mm. talk about routes, it's not just from mm. you to the school, work to home, those kinds of things. We also need routes to get us out of where we might be, danger areas. Mm. And so we need to look at where we're going and have a destination. And mm. oftentimes that destination might just be a hotel room in a city that's, you know, a little bit away that kind of gets us out of the immediate area. If you're on the coast, maybe it's a little inland. So for instance, my children live in Virginia Beach. Um, we look at pushing to Richmond if there's ever struggles with hurricanes or anything mm -hmm. like that during that season, because at least it's out of the beaten path generally. If they get out of the area and they stay in a hotel, well, it was one little night's vacation if nothing happened. And we had this happen actually uh, a few years ago. We had a hurricane that was bearing down right at Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Hampton Roads area. And at the last second, it turned south, hit North Carolina pretty bad. But during that time, that's when we have a plan, even my, myself, my ex-wife, my kids, we all know where we're going to meet on the 95 corridor. We know what locations we're going to be at with medical. We know here's our primary location to meet. If all the communications is down and we're not there, we leave a, a visual signal. We know where to leave that visual signal. We move on to the next place south and we work our way north to south down the 95 corridor at specific locations that we already knew. They're already marked on maps in vehicles with the kids. Mm. So when we say routes, it's not just to and from your everyday mm. stuff. It's also to get out of the area as quick as possible. Mm. Yeah, no, that makes good sense. 
Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about routes, communications, right? Mm -hmm. All within the construct of this mm -hmm. primary alternate contingency emergency, mm -hmm. um, a sense of normalcy and mm -hmm. doing a little of stress inoculation to kind of ease into some of these things, being familiar with your equipment, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about water. Waters, um, if, if you haven't had any guests thus far, have you ever been uh, heard of the rule of threes? I've read about it, but I don't think we've discussed it on the show. Okay, so generally the rule of threes is you can go mm -hmm. three minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food. Mm -hmm. um, so you notice that air, pretty important, but water's mm -hmm. next. Right? So, so the comment I was making mm -hmm. is we should probably yeah. have a way to have water on hand, a way to carry mm -hmm. more water if we do find it, a way to at a minimum filter it, and then maybe um uh my brain is uh frozen right now uh mm -hmm. where we can purify it thank you so there is a mm -hmm. difference between filtering and purifying okay mm -hmm. so we'll walk through that a little bit so i tend to have a bag that just has a nalgene full of water and i'll drink water out of it replace it and i just keep it in there and it keeps it pretty good i will also recommend uh source bladders so there are like a camelback but there are different brands source they have a great locking bite valve they are really, really tough hose. Um, they, you can put an inline filter in it if you want. You can open up the top of it. They're super durable. They, you can fit water filters on them. I've, I've filled those up and stood on them. I'm over 200 pounds and I can stand on the bladders. Never had one leak, never had one bust. They're a fantastic product. If we're talking about water bladders, I really like source bladders. Um, but I'll usually have something that I just keep some water in. And then I'll have uh, MSR makes these larger, I don't remember what they're called. They're like these black Boda bags. They go from like two liters to 10 liters. And so they're mm -hmm. really tough material. And so I just keep one of those rolled up. And then um, I tend to have a water filter uh, because I don't like drinking gross water. So what I mean by that is that you can take uh, Nalgene, you can dump it in some pond wa water that's all kind of scummy. You can purify that water, kill everything in it with like a SteriPen or something like that, but it's still gross, green, floaty water. Not my jam. That's not how I like to get down. Uh, so I like to have something that I can filter that water with. And then if it needs purified for Giardia or something like that, uh, we can purify it as well, depending on the type of filter. Um, good methods are always boiling. You know, if you're unsure, boil your water. Uh, my only real concern is that if you're in an urban area and you have to scavenge water for somewhere, you've got some potential for heavy metals. Actually, you have that potential in farming areas as well. But um, just like some of those heavy metals, heavy metals and chemicals are tough to get out of water. So I prefer to have as much as I need on me. But that's, again, you know, weight and space get a vote. Yeah, boiling out the water might. I spent uh, my my sons are ten years apart, so the year oh, the, the youngest turned four and five, and the year the oldest one went from fourteen to fifteen. We spent in Malaysia, um, partially so that they would appreciate not having to boil their water every day. Yeah, yeah. Some people don't understand like that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. We we take a lot of things. I mean, we're very very fortunate mm -hmm. that generally speaking, mm -hmm. our quality of life is pretty high when it comes to some of the discussion points that we're talking about. I mean, as sure. simple as having communications and navigation on a phone with pretty mm -hmm. good coverage around the country, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that was unheard of even, what, 10 years ago, right? Yeah. So we're, we're pretty spoiled these days. Sometimes mm -hmm. it takes a little bit to put the phone down, get out into, I'm using the air quotes, <laughs> real world and try some other things, right? Again, goes back to that stress inoculation. Take the phone away. You'll be amazed at how stressed out your kids are for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And so just making sure that you have plenty of water on hand and ways to store water you find and turn bad water into good water, because yeah. that can become an emergency really fast. And not just with that three day thing, but also, I can't remember, I read, I'm sure I read this stat sometime and you might have it off the top of your head, but how quickly dehydration reduces your higher order thinking skills and makes it harder for you to survive. Yeah, I don't know the amount of time, but it's mm. very fast. And and yeah. I will tell you, uh, when I was a SEER instructor in the military, we were pretty adamant about, like, we would deprive the students mm. of everything, but pretty adamant about water. 
Um, we, that was just the one thing because you can do irreparable damage by both by dehydration and then you know if you have heat stroke or anything like that it gets really really problematic so from a training environment we always push a lot of water uh, to make sure people can keep themselves at least thinking straight being able to perform um, and, and that's a kind of an important piece of this as well is if there is if there is ever any kind of an event you find yourself in a bad situation generally speaking it's really important to act quickly because you're not going to ever be in as good a health with as much sleep with as you know food in your belly water going through your system as that moment right if you live a basic normal life everything else after that you're trying to play catch up so it's really mm -hmm. important if you've got to do moves if you've got to um, you know escape a situation whatever that is Better to do it a little sooner than later. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. writing it out can deplete you too much and then you won't be able to move at all. And even something, even in a less extreme circumstance, the plan you were talking about, going 60 miles inland and spending a night in a hotel. Mm -hmm. If you pull the trigger too late, there's going to be that big no vacancy sign. Yes. Yeah. You know, so, you know, move, yep. er, move early, move often. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the piece about that, right, it comes down to planning. Uh, so typically when I teach in a classroom environment, I begin my course by teaching the planning as we would overseas. Like I, I teach it as an operation. I use the same format. And the reason I do that is because military and, and government agencies are pretty good at laying out an operational order to where it encompasses all of the things that might come up. And those pieces of the puzzle like okay cool first thing is going to be that hotel room and these are our go no go kind of criteria as to when we're going to do that and and as you said you know if, if you wait too long at that hotel might and that's your only one your only one plan right no pace at all like if this then this and nothing else you could be in for a rude awakening. Uh, it could be really, really mm -hmm. problematic. And we've seen that uh, last year with a lot of the hurricanes that hit down south. People were having to go mm -hmm. north of Atlanta just to find a hotel room that was open. Yeah. And it's, I think the point you brought, made about go, no go, about having a plan mm -hmm. that you sit down with well ahead of time and say, okay, under these circumstances, we're going to head out. Yeah. Um, because you sitting at the dinner table with your spouse, drinking some tea or coffee or monster or whatever, making a plan that you is far smarter than the you who is watching the news and getting progressively more scared and wondering when your teenager is going to get home. Yeah. And we trust the smart person who made the plan under ideal circumstances over the already uh, adrenally compromised person you are in the moment in a exactly lot of ways. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and just to, to, touch more on that, mm -hmm. right? To further exacerbate issues is that if now if you're combining people that are either not on the same page mm -hmm. or are emotionally charged because of the stress that they're feeling and they have not talked about these circumstances. So you may have you and your family that are like, hey, we got to go, we've got a plan. You may have the in-laws that are in the same town. Mm -hmm. Oh no, we're just going to stay here and write it out. Well, now we have this, this it's not a confrontation, but it's still a discrepancy in our objectives and how we're going to move forward mm -hmm. with them. I would rather try and work all that out beforehand. Even if it comes out to, hey, they're going to stay, they're invested, they're going to stay at their house, we're going to go to the hotel. At least you knew beforehand instead of having to deal with a further complication of that mm -hmm. conflict during that stressful situation. So I think, yeah. you know, to your point, it is really important to talk about these things, get it on the same page, and then back to communicating that and having it laid out with your loved ones because if something happens you have to move and you've got a you said a 14 15 year old about that uh no he was 14 when we were in malaysia he's 21 oh, okay. now you oh, got 21 oh, oh. and 21 and 11 now gotcha okay so even <laughs> yeah. now your 11 year old is getting to a point where it's like well mm -hmm. if the parents aren't at home they're going to be here or i know if mm -hmm. i call here and i don't get an answer i can text here like all yeah. of those things to just build into <laughs> your natural environment, just kind of make it organic to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't personally think that it's an overreach. I think that it's often seen that way. I think people look and they're like, well, I don't want to be the doomsday prepper people and I don't want to be caught with my shorts down. So where's the happy medium in there? And that's, mm -hmm. that's why I appreciate podcasts like yours, because I mean, it's, 
it's something that people can latch onto and it's putting out good information in a way that they can actually um, build into their life and not have to just kind of yeah. send on the, you know, yeah. buying the bunker in the middle of Kansas kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think it's important to kind of internalize that although a lot of the prepping stuff is for those serious situations, the imaginary zombie apocalypse, mm -hmm. you know, end of the world as we know it, um, or even a natural disaster. But if you're good for, say, a hurricane, mm -hmm. you are great for a car breakdown. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and I, that's a great way to look at it. I, I tend to look, I talk to people about where they are regionally. Even if we train people that are going overseas, we say, okay, let's talk about your region. Let's talk about what's probable, not just possible, right? We can't exclude the possible, but we focus on the probable and we try to go pretty high event with big risk so that if we are prepared for that, everything else, most everything else just kind of falls in line underneath it. So that's a great way to look at it. It's very much like, you know, I have a couple of friends who are Taekwondo black belts. I, I didn't study Taekwondo myself. I don't have an issue with it. But, you know, I, I tease them about why do you kick all the way to the head? You never want to kick someone in the head in an actual situation. Mm. And their response was, if I can kick that hard to the head, imagine what I can do to his knee. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's a great way right. to look at it. Yep. And it's the same kind of thing. You, you train for much more and prep for much, much worse than is likely. Yeah. And, and again, if you're doing it and you're mm -hmm. incrementally improving your situation, right? So then when there is an mm -hmm. event, it's, it's not that big a deal. I, you know, I often see just to put things in the context of what we've seen over the last year, this panic buying and people mm -hmm. hoarding things. It, it's pretty astounding to me because I've been in a couple situations, you know, I've, I was in Northern Virginia when they had Snowmageddon and mm -hmm. I've always been pretty prepared. I could stay in my place for quite a while. Um, and I went into the grocery store because I just happened to be getting my hair cut next door and there's people freaking out. I mean, they've just got mm -hmm. carts full of everything. I just went to the ice cream section because I like ice cream. And that was the one thing that I figured people aren't really going to be buying up at the time. So I figured I'll just get ice cream, you know, yeah. uh, but, but my point here, I mean, obviously yeah. I'm joking a little bit, but um, mm -hmm. the point here is, is that the more prepared you are and the more easily you look at some of these things that come up and you play the what if game and how you would handle things and the more your family's on board because you've incrementally kind of induced this into your family and not introduced mm -hmm. this and it hasn't just been this big sucker punch hey we're going to do this now I, mm -hmm. I see people being a lot more calm and mm -hmm. they know they can ride some things out they're not as concerned about oh my gosh I might run out of toilet paper you know those kinds of things just don't come up for the people that have been putting some effort and time into this. And that calmness is also so important for our kids to see, mm -hmm. for our kids to experience. You know, I think a lot of parents worry about this kind of thing, this kind of preparation and think, well, I'm going to scare my children. But if your kids see you preparing in a calm way, in a rational way, and then responding to minor emergencies without freaking out because you are ready for them, yeah. I think that's, that's the, that's the counter argument and the better argument in my opinion. Yes, for sure. I, I would rather take that than small circumstances coming out and mm -hmm. them seeing that you have no answer. You have no mm -hmm. thought process, right? Like mm -hmm. me, do I want to be the role model that all I do is freak out because I'm unprepared? That's, that's not messaging that I want my children to come, come away yeah. with. Right. Mm -hmm. And I want them to trust to know that like, Hey, if things go down, they can reach out to me. That's, that's important mm -hmm. to me. So, yeah. Um, so we've talked about, a little bit of communications. We've talked a little bit about water, um, a little on the mobility, but let's touch mm -hmm. on food. You want to touch on food? Yeah, absolutely. For a bit? Absolutely. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. So um, people can go a long time without food, mm. but everybody likes to eat. I don't know about you, but I'm a fan. Food is, I, I'm, a, I'm a happy guy when I'm eating some food, right? So again, mm -hmm. back to that sense of normalcy, I often see people and they'll buy some like, hey, these bars are good for 25 years and you get 6,000 calories per bar and they throw them in their bag and they're great. Well, some people don't even test them. I've tried a few of them. They're not awesome. Um, <laughs> generally speaking, that is not where I want to spend mm -hmm. my day eating some like compressed, uh, you know, medium density fiber board kind of mm -hmm. bar that has a hint of orange flavor. That's not my jam. Mm -hmm. um, so what I will say with food is even just some light snacks, throwing in some cliff bars. Most kids, you know, they'll mm. eat a cliff bar because it's chocolate chip or, you know, some of these prepackaged foods that'll keep for quite a while that you don't mm. have to really think about it. 
those are usually enough for smaller mobility circumstances, meaning I need to get back from work. I would also from there, I would look at um, some of the dehydrated meals. So you have Peak Fuel, Mountain House, Backpackers Pantry, I think it's called. Mm. And there's, there's several of them go into any REI, Sportsman's Warehouse Cabela's. They have lots of them. The downside is one, they use water. So you have to have enough water to be able to eat and uh, heat it up and eat with it. Um, number two, you have to have a way to heat up the water to put in there. Uh, so you need like a jet boil or an MSR stove or something like that. Um, so none of those are, are, you know, off the table. It's just, you have to make sure you have some of those other items that go coincide with that. Um, but good bars, prepackaged meals that are pretty good things that are going to keep for a while. I, I'll tell you, I know people that just do peanut butter and jelly and tortilla wraps. Cause for whatever reason, tortilla wraps unopened keep for a long time. And they keep the peanut butter and the jelly unopened. And they're just like, yeah, if I get in trouble, at least I know I've got good calories that my kids will eat. So just, just, you know, crackers, things like that. Those mm -hmm. are, those are things that'll appease people, give you some pretty good caloric and uh, caloric count that you'll need mm -hmm. uh, calories. And it will keep everybody just a little bit happier as we're going through some of these arduous mm -hmm. situations for the longer term food prep you can get more bulk of the dehydrated foods, which are good. Mm. But the easiest way is canned goods. I mean, honestly, you go to the store, spend an extra three, four dollars every time and just start adding cans here and there and then just rotate them in and out of your food supply. So uh, the last one in is stays in there and the, the oldest one in is the one that you use and you can just kind of cycle through some of that shelf life. Yeah. Although it has the same drawbacks as dehydrated food, I'm also a fan of just you know, a few metric tons, I'm exaggerating just a little bit of rice and beans. Yeah. They keep forever. Sure. And it's a solid meal that'll, it's not, it's not the tastiest thing in the universe, but it'll get you, it'll get you from day one to day 12. Yeah. And, and that's where I try to mix things up. Right. So I like having yeah. some, uh, you know, if I've got a freezer full of frozen goods, which usually mm. meats and things like that. And then I have lots of canned goods and dried stored goods. Um, things that are pretty easy to, you know, cook under a short amount of time. And then I get into longer term dehydrated foods because then now I can kind of mix these together. I can take mm -hmm. a mountain house meal, I can dump a can of beans in it and add mm -hmm. some spam. And I've got a pretty hearty meal that's going to give me a lot of calories. Right. So I like mixing up what I have. And then, as you said, those long term staples, right, beans and rice and flours and things like that. Beans and rice are fantastic they do take a little bit of work. Like you can't mm. just like literally throw them together in a cup and hope things turn out. Okay. Uh, they take a little bit of time to prepare a little bit of water to do so. Mm. But as you said, the shelf life is, is unbelievable, right? They'll keep forever. Um, honey is another one, you know, honey keeps for forever. So those kinds of long-term storage pieces are good. Mm. Um, from a mobility standpoint, that's where we have to look at things too, right? Like am I, yeah. Am I keeping my house and my shelter in place plan pretty good or somewhere I'm going to go? Am I storing long-term storage there? And then what do I want to take with me to connect the dots? Because if I'm mm. trying to be mobile, I've got comfortable shoes. I've got a decent backpack. I've got my change of clothes. I know where I'm going. I've got a good route. I've communicated with whoever I need to. I'm not carrying 30 pounds of canned goods. Just not, not going to do it. Right. So it's going to be yeah. things that are a little bit more portable and mobile. So if people can kind of start looking that way into layering the types of foods that they have and then mm -hmm. uh, utilizing it for the appropriate method, they'll probably have some pretty good success. And I think that's that pace plan that you're talking about pay, plays in here heavily. Like if you're, if your place to go is to your prepper cousin's house, a mm -hmm. hundred miles away, and you've got enough food on hand to drive there. Yep. But what if you have to bike there? What if you have to walk there? Yeah. yeah. And those are different Changes amounts things. of food and water that you need. Yeah. It goes from three hours to three days. Mm -hmm. Those are different, mm -hmm. different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's some other ways to solve that. Right. But I think if mm -hmm. people start asking them the, themselves those questions and they say, okay, well, my, mm -hmm. my main place I want to get to is a hundred miles away. Okay, well, that's going to be a bit of a challenge if the roads are going to be closed or congested or weather. So what are some incremental places I can get to to hole up, maybe resupply a little bit, you know, maybe there's somebody I don't know as well as my super prepper buddy, but, you know, it's somebody where I could probably just crash for the night, and probably get a decent meal, right? Like, 
So if people start looking at the things that way, I think they'll have more success and be more confident. Mm. And so we've talked about communications. We've talked about routes. We've talked about water. We've talked about food. Yep. And we've kind of overlaid mobility on all of those. Which yeah. Makes sense because it's involved in each of those steps. What are, what are the other steps that we should consider? So let's, you brought up mobility. Let's ping on that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So bare bones. I mean, I understand people are not going to go out and buy a specific vehicle, but mm -hmm. I would at least recommend like if you can and you have a vehicle, keep a few key things in there. Um, keep things in there that are going to, don't, don't let your gas tank go below about half a tank or so, especially in the last week or so, we've seen some nuttiness with gas. Uh, so, you know, try and keep your tank topped off when you can. Um, if you have one of those locations, make sure that you've got about, you know, that much gas plus 20, 30%, because that's usually your mileage based on highway speeds, not bumper to bumper, eking around, moving away off some side and surface roads, those kinds of things. Um, in the vehicle is a great place to keep a lot of these stuff. My, I'm often scared to open the doors in my vehicle and let people look in simply because they'll be like, what are you doing? Um, I, I spend a lot of time on the road. I spend a lot of time in the mm -hmm. backcountry, So my, my uh, vehicle is pretty well equipped, but even for the normal commuter, again, just that footwear, those good socks, couple layers, a bag with some water and some snacks, those things make your life much better. And then stacking those routes and those, that mobility. So if you have to transition from my primary is my vehicle, Secondary might be a foldable bike in the trunk. Mm -hmm. Tertiary, I'm sorry, uh, uh, contingency might be that, hey, I'm going to put on my Solomons and I'm going to step out and I'm going to have to walk. It's not going to be as good as riding or driving, but that's part of the plan, right? If everything else fails. Um, so, yeah, we can, we can delve into a lot of these. I'm just trying to give kind of mm -hmm. some overviews with a yeah. little bit of detail to work through it to get people thinking a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so let's talk about security. How about mm -hmm. that? That's another big one, right? Because if we aren't secure, you're basically just holding stuff for somebody else to take. Mm -hmm. um, so in that security, you know, it becomes a challenge because every state municipality is a little bit different when it comes to firearms. Um, firearms are a great equalizer. They take the 5'2", 110 pound female and they make her equal to the 6'3", 245 pound gorilla, right? Mm -hmm. um, the good news is probably near and dear to your heart is martial arts and combatives. They close the gap as well. Um, so I would highly recommend people have some kind of training. If, if you've never been punched in the face or thrown down onto the mat ever, go do something that you get to do that because it's, it's kind of fun. Um, and then, you know, there's also that physical conditioning as well, because that, that's, time and distance and being able to move and continue to move and be able to defend for yourself goes back to that physical conditioning that you're in. Um, so I probably prioritize that number one, honestly, across the board on many of these things that we're discussing. Um, good physical fitness, some mm -hmm. level of combatives or martial arts, and then firearms. And there are other less lethal things. You know, you can get pepper spray uh, uh, or mace in many places. That's very effective. Um, avoiding crowds is going to be a big one for your security uh, people if you've probably ever heard the adage a person is smart but people are stupid mm -hmm. um, that seems to be the case the larger the crowds the more likely things are going to go sideways uh, so avoiding crowds might be a good idea as well for your security mm -hmm. um, you know there's 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 safety in numbers you know that one person might be able to move pretty quickly but we need to have everybody including our own organic family unit you know, trained to look at people, to understand body language and to understand things that we would be looking for. Um, the, the, the positive of being uh, an adult, especially people that have put themselves in harm's way or been you know, on the streets for a long time in their life is you learn some social cues, you learn some body language, you can learn predators. And so Anytime we can learn to manage unknown contacts, stay out of trouble, de-escalate mm -hmm. any of those situations is going to be way better for us as opposed to then having to turn to martial arts, mace, firearms, et yeah. cetera. Right. And I also want to touch on with firearms, they are important equalizer, but everything you said about getting trained and everything you put in your bug out bag, 
otherwise you risk making a bad situation worse is 10 times as important when it comes to a firearm. Agreed. Do not, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a second amendment supporter. I do not love people picking up a gun and thinking their security job is done just because they bought it at the store and they have it in the yeah. safe. Yep. No, I see that yeah. more often than mm-hmm. even like the prepackaged bug out gear and those kinds of mm-hmm. things. I, I mean, the gun industry is through the roof right now. Um, mm-hmm. And that just means, and, and so is the training side. I mean, I'm very, very busy doing firearms mm-hmm. training as well, but nowhere near the pace of people that are buying mm-hmm. those guns. They've got their one mm-hmm. box of ammo and they throw it in the safe and they're like, I'm good. I'm up. I'm safe. I got a gun. It's just not the case. It's just not. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I highly encourage people to seek training, uh, mm-hmm. find systems that take you and your abilities into consideration or your outcomes, meaning um, you mentioned Taekwondo, there are other combatives that you can take Brazilian mm-hmm. Jiu Jitsu, Krav Maga, there's, there's mm-hmm. lots of different ones. Um, if firearms is a part of that training uh, or a part of your history and experience, then I would want something that incorporates mm-hmm. those things. And so that you're looking at things systemically, uh, systematically, I apologize, mm-hmm. systematically, so that everything is incorporated. Um, mm-hmm. Oftentimes you don't see that. Uh, they seem to be no. like, here's my firearms, here's my combatives and never the two shall meet. Mm-hmm. So, no. And there's some, there's some really good instructors that really connect the dots in that, that way too. Um, one of my favorites yeah. is a guy named Craig Douglas from Shiv Works. Uh, if you want to learn about fighting in a phone booth, He's your guy. He's a great guy. And also, if you're going to have a gun in the home, going to have a gun in the car, also get a trauma kit and know how to use it. Yep. Yeah, that's a great one to transition from. Um, that is one that I see a lot. People are buying it. They're like, hey, I need medical gear. Or they'll ask online, hey, what do I need in my medical, my, my first aid, IFAC, mm-hmm. whatever, uh, individual first aid kit is the acronym mm-hmm. there. Um, and, and oftentimes there's zero training behind it. They just mm. think that if they've got, you know, some hemostatic agent like quick clot and they see tourniquets super popular and, you know, they've got a chest seal and they're like, oh, well, I'm good. Um, mm. Well, I, I've been around a block enough to know that you're not good. You're, <laughs> you're not good unless there's some, some real training behind that. Mm. Uh, because you were mentioned earlier about, you know, handling emergencies, medical emergencies, are usually more like they're perceived more than other things meaning mm. you can have gas running out you could have a hurricane coming and those are like panic moments but it's just not quite the same as somebody bleeding out right in front of you and yeah. so that's when you especially really if it's your kid or your spouse exactly right exactly right yeah so mm. great medical training um there's great brands out there so if you look at from the, the products perspective North American Rescue is fantastic. They do not put out anything that is a bad product. It's tried and true. All of their staff, almost every item they have is used by the US military. They are a fantastic quality company. Mm -hmm. Um, There are a couple, Dark Angel Medical does both kits and training. There's a couple other ones uh, that are out there. I'll try and get you some notes so people have some sources for those. You can put them in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's some really good product, but again the 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 kits and all the cool gucci gear does not make you the medic right Mm -hmm. so you have to an easy start is stop the bleed courses those are really really good they're they're low impact but you get a lot of training for your time and dollar Um, you can go into some tccc which is a tactical combat casualty care type courses they do offer some of those for civilians there's different iterations now that are for civilians um, and then you can get through, you know, your EMT, paramedic, and those kinds of things. Um, there's some really, really good uh, medical courses out there as well that are bolt-ons to some of the firearms and tactics. So in other words, they'll teach you to win the fight and then also mm-hmm. treat the trauma medicine uh, in there. Mm-hmm. And so again, I, I highly encourage getting people that kind of exposure. Uh, at a minimum, sometimes it's just to see what you don't know and know where you need to really, like, what's your next path? Where are you spending your training dollars after that? So, And to be clear, the uh, Red Cross first aid CPR AED thing that your boss made you take four years ago, although valuable, is not this thing. And that's right. we need that's more right. than that. To yeah, be we're talking a, a, about a level of care higher than that, right? We're mm. talking about trauma. Not You mentioned earlier pulling the bee sting out, mm. which is a funny uh, if I may anecdotally tell a story, sure. um, I was protecting a, a billionaire down in Costa Rica and his wife was not very happy about having security. She just was one of the people who didn't like security. 
and then she got stung by something unidentified. And so I always travel with a pretty comprehensive medical kit that's complemented with trauma items inside. Good tweezers, paid off, pulled it out, cleaned everything up, told her, hey, let's check on it if it's bad in the morning or is in pain or swelling, we'll call you know, medical. But just that act, act of pulling that, that uh, little barb out, all of a sudden security was okay. She was super happy with us, you know? So, so that was one of those shifts in the, in the relationship, yeah. right? Because you had the right tool on hand and somebody you knew how to use them. That's right, that's right. And somebody that's looking at yeah. problem solving and not just freaking mm -hmm. out. She was yeah. kind of freaking out. She's a little bit freaking <laughs> out. So, okay, so we've covered food, water, medical, um, mobility. Routes, communication, mobility. Yeah, communication. Yep. Let's talk about sanitation, just for a moment. Sanitation. So I think we all probably anybody that's ever been camping understands that you're probably not going to come back as clean as when you left that morning. Um, that's, you know, we, we just kind of accept that as being the case, but sanitation, even for a short amount of time, say a day or two can be problematic. So there's just a couple things. And again, it goes back to some of that normalcy. Um, if we can brush our teeth, we can use some baby wipes and clean ourselves up and we can put on a fresh pair of socks. It's like you're brand new. So it helps your positive mm. mental attitude, but also keeps our risk for infection down, um, makes us more like if I'm going to somebody and say, hey man, I could really use some help. And he's looking at me and I look like I've been on the streets of you know, New York City uh, for you know, mm. five weeks versus, hey, I just literally overnight, I had to walk eight miles. Like I, it's not really been that bad. I just look, look really bad, right? We want yeah. our appearance to be a little bit more digestible to other people. And again, it just keeps everybody a little happier. So mm. when I remember the first time I took my son camping and he had to go number two in the woods. It was a pretty significant experience for a seven-year-old, right? Like it was a <laughs> big deal. And there's still adults that are like, well, what do you do, right? Um, so just having sanitation, um, and I'm going to throw in there sanitation and I'm going to, it's kind of borderline between sanitation, medical is any, um, prescription medicines that you need. Mm. Just take a couple days off. If you need to put them in your vehicle, stash them somewhere else where you're always going to have them. So that way, again, these series of unfortunate events, you happen to forget your, I'm just using an example, your mm -hmm. blood pressure medicine. You just yeah. happen to forget it that day and then you've got this event and now you're going to be into two days three days without your heart medicine could have some significant ramifications so i just like to tell people like keep good sanitary items like baby wipes um isopropyl alcohols another going to hydrogen peroxide all of those are kind of sanitation items that cross over a little bit into the medical mm -hmm. um be able to brush your teeth comb your hair a little bit for me i got to comb up my beard it gets pretty ratty and, uh, and, and any of those prescription medicines, and that will put you ahead of the power curve for sustaining yourself for a day or two, um, just put you in a better place, right? Just those little things. Yeah. And a, a good, uh, hit for that one is if you go to a decent hotel, it's going to have the, especially abroad, it's, it's more common mm -hmm. abroad than the United States. I'm not sure why they're going to have that little toiletry kit, kit there for you waiting in the yeah. bathroom, just Yoink it, put it in your bag, keep the little collection at home. Yeah. You've got something for overnight guests who didn't bring their own stuff. And you've got a nice little supply of easily portable toothpaste, soap, yeah. toothbrushes, and all those things right there on hand. Yeah, 100%. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those that is very easy. I do the exact same thing. If I go somewhere, <laughs> I'll take the, like just the little bars of soaps, little shampoos, mm -hmm. just always have those. And, and I'm kind of like Johnny Appleseed. Like I have my dedicated stuff. But I'm like, well, I'm going to put these in my travel bag. I'll have mm -hmm. one of these in my shoulder mm -hmm. bag, you know, just in case you just, you just don't yeah. know, you know, and they don't hardly weigh anything and I'll swap them out occasionally. But I've been amazed at how often I have to use them because I've forgotten something else, just making my life a little bit easier. Yeah. And if your supply cache starts looking more like a hoarder's nest, uh, homeless shelters love these. Yeah. Homeless shelters, Ballard Women's Shelters, these little prepackaged toiletry kits, they absolutely love those for donations. Yeah, that's a great tip. Yeah, I like yeah. that. I've not heard that before, so that's great. Mm. Outstanding. All right. So, so food sanitation, water, food, water, security, sanitation, mm. mobility, uh, medical. I think we've talked a little bit about that on the sanitation side. Mm. Um, I would just 
touch up with um, if you have young children like need diapers make sure diapers are included in that that's never a good time if you run out of diapers um, feminine hygiene products also probably need to be included in there just again series of unfortunate events would be untimely to be isolated and then also have uh, mm. you know other things to contend with yeah i always figured my uh plan for the zombie apocalypse would be to while everybody else is getting ammunition and everything stock up on advil tampons and condoms yeah yeah, yeah, two years yeah. late, two years down the road. Yeah, you're I'll running be... harder town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and and I'll tell you, you yeah. mentioned like the hotels. Uh, mm -hmm. You can go into like dollar stores, Dollar Trees, mm -hmm. and for about thirty or forty dollars, you can get a lot of stuff on the medical sanitation side. Yeah, and and in, you know you're not spending a lot, and you're getting um, mm -hmm. quite a bit of quality items that you could use for exactly mm -hmm. these kinds of circumstances. So it doesn't take a lot yeah. to really get ahead of the power curve for these little things. And oftentimes Absolutely. it is the little things that just make the difference in your, uh, as we said, mm -hmm. into your positive mental attitude in your ability to cope with the circumstances that are occurring at the time, that sense mm -hmm. of normalcy. Um, it's, it, yeah. it's really, really helpful. Everybody wants to like, Hey, I've got my long range 338 Lapua sniper rifle with night vision, but, 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 but like, awesome. I've got a good pair of shoes and a backpack and I'm going to be able to brush my teeth and walk out of this situation. You know, I mean, mm. I just, I, I try to be somewhat pragmatic about the advice that I give yeah. with these kinds of things. Well, I think as parents, especially, you know, our job is when things start going sideways, keep inconveniences from becoming emergencies, keep emergencies from becoming tragedies. Mm. And this is exactly the kind of information and equipment we need to do that. Yeah, I, I often sure. see, I mean, people could do a lot better at just fixing, like, as you said, these little sure. inconveniences, but because they find themselves um, in short sure. supply, lack of training, poor decision making, poor planning, things sure. go really bad in a hurry. Um, sure. And then generally their actions are knee jerk and they're trying to, sorry, I have a plane going over. <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, so their reactions are to, um, hoard or be emotional or reactive in some way. And um, I just, I would like people to have, uh, I'd like to empower people. I want people to have mm -hmm. that, that confidence to know that they've mm -hmm. been exposed to little things incrementally and that they can, you know, they can mm -hmm. survive these kinds and these kinds of events and prevail um, and just always be what if and looking at what they, what they mm -hmm. can improve their circumstances. That's really, I try to, to give people that mindset. And speaking of empowering people and giving them that mindset, you do a num you do a number of classes and trainings. I do. Yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell so, us a bit about that. So um, I uh, I've been very fortunate to work with some very high end military and government entities, which is great. I still like working with them. Uh, but what I found myself recently is trying to, and and I use this as a a bit of a you know, a, a euphemism or a colloquialism, as it were, uh, the, the soccer moms, right? And, mm -hmm. and I say that mean on the same message you and I were talking about, right? It's mm -hmm. about family. It's about people that are just trying to better themselves. Because for me, if society looks at things a little bit better, then we raise the bar. And we, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have people that, it, like, if their phone dies, they're basically going to freak out and be in the fetal position. I want people, mm -hmm. the, the masses in general, to be able to look at situations and go, yeah, I can get through this. I got this. Yeah. And so that's important to me. Uh, so my company is Anomaly Management Services. Um, you can find me online at anomalymanagement.com. And then uh, I teach for a couple other companies. I teach um, protection for a company called ESI down in Grand Junction. Mm -hmm. uh, they are a premier uh, protection company in the United States or school, I should say. Um, and then I have a company out of Richmond, Virginia called Divergent Resource Group. Uh, we also do training through them. And so we look at lots of firearms and tactics mm -hmm. and all those kinds of things, medical training as well. Um, but my personal favorites are that preparedness and mission planning courses, because of those two go really, really well for the average person that doesn't do a lot of planning. It's a good template to learn. Mm -hmm. And then the bug out and go bag classes mm. that go from there and and uh, it's it's for everyday people kids invited mm. i want people to be comfortable i want you know i look at the lack of things that we had as children or, or i'm sorry things that we had as children that are somewhat lacking now like when i went through boy scouts 
compared to putting my son in scouts was a vastly different experience. And I think a lot of the confidence that I got was from scouts as a kid um, in, in this kind of world. And I would want people to have that same kind of thing. So if I can get kids, teenagers, um, uh, women, elderly, anybody that wants to come, I'm always happy to get them a little bit better than they were. That's all I can offer is I can try and make you a little bit better than you are now. Well, that's the goal, right? Be better today than you were yesterday. You'd be better tomorrow than you are today. Yeah. And, and, and the, mm -hmm. the beauty of that, including your podcast and, and the training, um, and it's something that we haven't talked about a whole lot. We talked about your, your prepper that's 100 miles away, your <laughs> uncle or brother, or cousin, whatever it was. Yeah. But it's the network. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. being alone through uh, an arduous situation is no fun for anybody. So having a good network, people that you can count on, people that are like-minded, I think is tremendously important. And that can be gained from this form of media, the training courses, um, and some groups online, things like that. Absolutely. Well, Josh, I really want to thank you for coming on today. Uh, sure. Before we finish up, you've done other podcasts, you teach a lot, you've trained and protected people all over the world. Is there something that people don't give you enough opportunity to talk about? And if so, hold forth, sir. Uh, whew. Um, you know, I think the big one's mindset. I think that's a big one. And, and I think that you get the Dunning-Kruger effect, meaning people that, you know, think they know a lot about stuff that they really mm -hmm. don't. And that kind of slaps them in the face. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where people just aren't, they, they just don't have the right mindset. And I think if anything over the last year or so, I mean, I, fortunately or unfortunately, I spent a good portion of my military and post-military life in, in bad places. Uh, so you kind of just kind of get it beat into you, like not literally, but you kind of get that mindset. Um, I think we're starting to see people get a similar mindset and they just don't quite know how to focus it. And so that's what I, if I could, I would love to have discussions about mindset to make sure people are right where they need to be, right in that sweet spot. And yeah, that kind of calibration of understanding how much you know, how much you don't know. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, Mr. Dunning and Mr. Kruger whipped it right out and slapped me across the face with it when I adopted my oldest today, Jay. You know, because I'd come through there at that point, I was a fourth degree black belt. I'd done bouncing, I'd done bodyguard work, I'd fought in uh, sport fighting and done a couple of stupid things. And I thought I was kind of badass. Mm -hmm. And then the reality of being responsible for this eight year old life who was walking right around here with me all the time. Yeah. Really just smacked me upside the head with how many uh, things I didn't know. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's kind of how this podcast happened. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's, um, it's, I guess, I mean, it was, at least it was like the notion that, hey, I probably don't know everything and coming without the, the, the reality that sometimes presents itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I, I had a very similar circumstance. I was, my, my daughter was three or four. My son was maybe one. I had my son on my shoulders, hand on one with my daughter and I was carrying groceries in the other one. And I came around on the sidewalk and there were some tall hedges and I came face to face with what my initial knee jerk reaction was, that's a bad guy. Just mm. my initial snapshot was that is not somebody I want to tangle with. And here I am with not one, but two children and not a, hey, time out. Give me just a second. I need to put my son mm. down before you assault me. I mean, those, those kinds of mm. things are those like, uh, uh, oh my gosh, moments where like, okay, mm. let's, let's get some of this figured out. Let's do things a little bit mm. better. So yeah, that, so. that mindset, something I really like to talk about. I'm glad you've had similar experiences in or. <laughs> driving toward getting other people in a, in a good space. Well, that's what I'm hoping, bringing conversations like this with people like you to my audience and to the soccer moms and the soccer dads. Yeah, 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 you know, perfect. Yeah, I'd love to talk yeah. about it again. If you ever have uh, time, I'd be happy to chat with you some more. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah, and no everybody will, will have links to these products you recommended and to Josh's training opportunities down in the show notes below. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you for watching today. I hope you found something useful or maybe even inspiring. If you liked what you saw, please take a few minutes to subscribe, like, and comment. Those little things add up to big help for the channel. If you loved it, consider checking out our Facebook page for more family safety news and information. And think about supporting us on Patreon, where you'll get early access, monthly training resources, blooper footage, and other exclusive benefits. You'll find links to both in the show notes. Most of all, thank you for being part of the safest family on the block team. Stay safe, everybody. See you next time.